On behalf of the hosts of the African Union Commission, the UNFPA and the Ford, I warmly welcome everybody here today, esteemed guests and panelists from across our vast continent of Africa and within the diverse African diaspora um, in the world to this very important dialogue as we commemorate today on the 25th of March, the annual United Nations Observance of International Day of Remembrance of Slavery Victims and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. This is also the time of the decade of the people, people of African descent um, and the memorial of the Ark of Return in New York is the permanent um, a monument to, to memorialize this very important occasion for time to pause on recognition, justice and development. The AU declared 2021 the year of arts, culture and heritage um, within a COVID context of compassion, of listening, of understanding in the Ubuntu concept uh, born in South Africa, I am because of you, you are because I am. I'm therefore honored to have been invited to moderate this important policy di uh, dialogue on culture in our time of crisis, as they would call it, and on the role of cultural heritage and tourism sectors in building forward better COVID, uh, post uh, COVID-19 world and continent. My name is June Bam Hutchison from the newly established uh, Sound and Koi Center, Center for African Studies at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And as we'd all certainly agree, this high level policy dialogue at this time in the world is an important three-way institutional partnership um, to take us forward to speak about culture and Pausing on the power of culture, we've all, you know, on the continent, um, Amilka Cabral uh, speaking about there can be no liberation without cultural liberation, or if you come from the Paulo Freire tradition, as uh, many Africans do, um, you know, uh, in intellectually, you know, cultural literacy, there can be no freedom without cultural literacy. The work of uh, Mangui Wationgo on language and Mangui Wagoro on language. So a range of different intellectuals on uh, cultural literacy, cultural freedom. Uh, without it, there can be no emancipation. If you take away the culture, you take away the freedom of the people. So without delaying this very important dialogue, um, they are, just to say there will be two sessions today on the policy dialogue, an opening session and, and to a panelist session. And of course, a third session, um, which will be interactive with the audience in attendance. So thank you everybody who is here from wherever you are in the world at this time. Um, so to commence our first session, I now invite um, our esteemed excellencies, ambassadors, um, to do the short of the short opening remarks um, to this policy dialogue. And there is an apology from Her Excellency Mrs. Amira Al-Fadil, would have been replaced by Ambassador Jello Shalba, but we are now very fortunate and honored to have Ms. Iman Kher of the African Union Commission. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, June. Um, the Under Secretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, Dr. Natalia Kanam, the Executive Director of the African Foundation for Development, Afford, my brother, Mr. Onyekachi Wambu, representative of the all UN agencies, African Union Commission, member states, diaspora organizations that are present with us here today, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening from Addis Ababa. Um, in commemoration of this International Day of Remembrance of Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic uh, Slave Trade, which happens every 25th of March, it is my honor to welcome you to the policy dialogue on culture in times of crisis. The role of culture, heritage, and tourism sectors in building forward better post COVID 19. Coincidentally, 2021 is uh, African Union's theme of the year is art, culture, and heritage. 
Allow me first, on behalf of His Excellency also, Mr. Musafaki Mahamad, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, to start by expressing my profound gra gratitude to our co-organizers, uh, UNFPA, but more specifically to our diaspora organization, AFFORD, for having persisted in ensuring that this event is actualized. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as the head of the diaspora division of the Directorate of Citizens and Diaspora Organizations, I must say that we are privileged to serve as the bridge between the diaspora and the member states to ensure that the diaspora activities are streamlined into policies and programs of the African Union Commission. Working to mobilize and harness the potential of the African diaspora towards the continent's development has always yielded commendable fruits to which the diaspora must be applauded. Notwithstanding the fact that countless actors have been noted to assist the continent in various aspects of the economy, the African diaspora have been known to be dependable development partners through the contribution of their finances, their skills, their network, and irrespective of the challenging situations that they encounter. The most topical of these diaspora humanitarian interventions in Africa is the advent and adverse impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the continent, which started since last year and continues to date. A quest to discover and revamp our culture and heritage, which are in the decline to lately, is therefore a positive step in the right direction. In agreement with Dr. Marcus Garvey, that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. I reiterate the importance of this spectacular day to us as Africans. And as the cradle of human civilization, all facets of African culture is undoubtedly rich and unique. The African Union identifies culture as a fundamental pillar and a viable, viable contributor to, to the continent's upward glide on the global stage. It is worthy to note that the African Union's Agenda 2063, Aspiration 5, envisions an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. Long time ago, this was exactly what Pan-Africanism was, a common heritage, common, a strong cultural identity, values, and ethics. To ensure that this dream is actualized, the division of culture has been mandated to harmonize and coordinate activities and policies across the continent in order to enhance opportunities for culture and to be used as a propeller for, propeller for integration, African Renaissance and cultural development. The division works with different member states, with different regional economic communities, and of course, with different non-state actors such as the diaspora and civil society to ensure the implementation of cultural policies that create jobs, promote the continent's enormous resources and skills and positively change lives. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, notwithstanding the fact that COVID-19 pandemic brought in its wake several incidents which gave rise for Africans to be more assertive in how we are perceived and treated by the rest of the world, there is the need for an in-depth reflection on how to utilize African arts, culture, and heritage to advance our integration with our diaspora and enhance continent's socioeconomic development. The time to have thoughtful de deliberations as well as map out the strategies and recommendation to harness African culture and heritage for development is now. Contextualizing the quotation from Nelson Mandela, I would state that indeed our rich and varied cultural heritage has a profound power to build our continent. Hence the importance of such policy dialogues from various sectors to ensure that knowledge and experiences are shared extensively to ensure progress using appropriate measures, including technology to revamp our ailing tourism sector into iconic culture and heritage site. I call on all of you today to participate actively through the panel discussions, remarks and questions in support of this Africa that we want. On this note, I thank you all for your attention and look forward to very sustainable outcomes for our mental bridges for our individual national continental and intercontinental thank you thank you thank you thank you Ms. Kamir and, and Kir and for reminding us on the Africa that we want which I think is the theme for 2021 um, and that message from very powerful message from the African Union Commission thank you it is now my great pleasure and honor to um, call upon a, 
Dr. Natalia Kanem of the United, the, the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director, the United Nations Population Fund. Um, welcome, Dr. Natalia Kanem. Well, thank you so much, Dr. June Bam Hutchinson, for your kind introduction. Dear uh, Ms. Elman Carey, the AU Citizens and Diaspora Directorate of the African Union Commission, Mr. Onyekachi Wambu, Executive Director of the African Foundation for Development, distinguished panelists, participants, and guests. African and, and Afro-descendant culture is indeed reflected in our customs, our music, our art, and other expressions of identity and creativity. They unite our people across the globe. It is indeed a common heritage of all humanity. And it reminds us that we share the same roots, the same present, and a common commitment to the future, to which each and every one of us must contribute if we want everyone to flourish. Yes, in this era of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen challenges to our societies. And yes, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected communities of African descent. It has also made it abundantly clear that we must stand together in unity. Therefore, I would like to acknowledge the leadership of the African Union. Since the onset of the pandemic, it has been inspiring to see the Commission engaging diaspora networks, seeking inputs and tapping knowledge and energies for the service of Africa and African descendants. COVID-19 is changing our world in unprecedented ways and we are witnessing the devastating economic toll. But in Africa and elsewhere for Afrodescendientes around the world, the arts and culture sector is stepping up. We know that arts and culture and heritage can make an important socioeconomic contribution. It can play a significant role in building forward better. As one example, in the year 2019, which Ghana dubbed the year of return, marking the 400th anniversary of victims of enslavement landing in the United States, injected an estimated almost 2 billion US dollars into that economy. I'm sure we will hear more about this later, according to the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. Now, despite a long history of undeniable discrimination and oppression, Afro descendants and the African diaspora continue to make significant contributions all over the world in various industries. And that includes music and arts, and of course, sciences, business, politics, philanthropy, and sport. Yet too often, these contributions go unrecognized. So now in the international decade for people of African descent, and with arts, culture, and heritage designated this year's theme by the African Union, we do have a chance, if we will take it, to cast a global spotlight on the many cultural achievements of people of African descent while bringing attention to the racism, the violence, and the inequities that they continue to face. The data speak for themselves. In Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, Peru, and Uruguay combined, Afro-descendants account for 38% of the total population, yet represent almost half of those living in extreme poverty. Afrodescendientes also had two and a half times more of a chance of living in chronic poverty. And let me say that women and girls bear the brunt of this inequality, including inequalities in access to healthcare, education, and employment. Women and girls suffer disproportionately also from gender-based violence. And all of these challenges hamper empowerment and the full realization of human rights. So if COVID is making matters worse and exacerbating existing inequalities, exacting a heavy economic toll on women, it also gives us the opportunity to rectify the damage done. Pandemic restrictions 
need not cause job loss in the informal labor market and in fields dominated by women, which include arts, culture, and tourism, but also health. Pay attention to building back better, or as the Secretary General has said, to building forward better, and let's not allow these important sectors to be overlooked. So as we support the future growth and income generation potential of the arts, culture, and heritage sectors, as we invest in women artists and freelancers and enhance their ability to learn to earn a decent living, we will need to close the digital divide, especially for marginalized groups who are offline. They have less and sometimes no access to digital technology. UNFPA has been at the forefront in supporting digital innovation in communities where we work with partners to provide, especially young entrepreneurs with seed funding, with mentorship and with technical support. And many of their innovations are sustainable solutions. They are transferable to the arts and culture sectors. So let me close distinguished guests by quoting the honorable Dr. Marcus Mazaya Garvey of Jamaica and the diaspora, as was just done, repeating that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And as we remember the enduring legacy of enslavement, let us also recognize the manifold, unique cultural contributions of people of African descent. These are contributions that have been a source of pride and strength to our communities for centuries. So let us continue to celebrate the depth, the breadth, and the richness of African history and the cultural influence of Africa across the globe and the role it can play in uniting us as we navigate the challenges and the opportunities of a post pandemic world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Natalia Kanim, for that wonderfully motivational speech and also to know that it will uh, draw so much on decades of, of work in the field. Um, it's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, we now going to invite Mr. Akwasi Awa Ababuyo, um, Director of Diaspora Affairs, Office of the President, Ghana, lead for the Ghana Diaspora Engagement Policy. Um, thank you, Mr. Ababio. Thank you. Um, June, it's a privilege to be here this afternoon, this afternoon here in Ghana. And I hope um, that the rest of the world would agree with me. That's um, it's, it's a bright day here. And, um, to also stand on the protocols already, you know, established by my previous um, speakers who have said so well about this event. And for me to also add that in remembrance of this um, victims of this uh, slavery, the trans-African slavery that uh, took place many years ago, the impact of which we are all aware and which we have all you know, done so many things in our different ways to celebrate. Ghana took it to a different level when we decided that uh, we would you know, go a long way and mark the year of 2019 as the year of return. So towards this, in this regard, I'm here today to share the experience of our year of return for this um, August gathering that we have here. And um, just to begin by saying that, yes, to commemorate the 400 years of anniversary, we celebrated the African resilience in Ghana by declaring the year 2019 as the year of return. And His Excellency Nana Dudankwa Akufuado officially proclaimed the year as a year of return when he was in Washington, DC, the heartland of the African-American community, the diaspora community to say, yes, Ghana has got an open arms. We are looking to welcome everybody back to Africa. The door of return that was meant to be door of no return 
was um, opened and that we wanted people to come back to where they were taken from and were assumed never to return. So we have the opportunity of welcoming the diaspora community to Ghana in 2019. And um, I think it uh, would be an understatement to say, yes, it was a huge success for us. And we are happy to share this experience. So the year 2019 began with a full cycle festival in 2018, when several celebrities, entrepreneurs, and notable business people from the US flocked to Ghana with their families. They visited you know, places of cultural heritage and provided an opportunity to learn as much as possible business potential through our global economic forums that they were engaged in. Prior to this, in 2018, the president had officially launched the year of return, as I've said already, and in conformance with our you know, leadership role, as far as you know, Pan-Africanism is concerned, which was uh, you know, previously being uh, played through our Joseph um, project, which was also basically um, a program that was meant to encourage uh, the people in the diaspora to come back to Africa in the, following the biblical you know, story of, of the Israelis having lived outside of um, Israel for so many years, 400 years, and going back to Israel to build Israel. Israel. So in that respect, we had already in place a project that we called the Joseph Project, that was also encouraging people to come back and you know, um, visit the homeland and to also be part of our social economic development. So we went ahead with many events that were held that year, which attracted high numbers from you know, visitors pumping around about 1.9 billion or you know, 2 billion, as we have had you know, some respect from our, you know, from our industry, the, 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 the tourism industry, you know, and our other related industries. The, the, the amount of money that was pumped into the economy would be around that figure that we have already had, the two billion um, as dollars, as we have already had. And um, because of this, because of the attention that we had sort of managed to, you know, raise for ourselves, notable media houses like the CNN, like the BBC, like you know, some of the media houses even in Europe, Sweden, and et cetera, and um, Switzerland, were all flocking in to have a bit of the pie to cover, give themselves content for their media houses. And most of the events that were held, you know, some of these events included the Ghana Diaspora Homecoming in July, a well-received event which allowed us to engage with the diaspora on a number of issues. Then there was the Panafest and the Back to Africa and the Afrochella and the Ghana Carnival, to name just a few. But these events were all purposefully done so as to entice our brothers and sisters in the diaspora to visit Ghana and to position Ghana as the gateway to Africa. The icing on the cake, we would say, was the events in the Jubilee House where the president conferred 126 members of the diaspora community, the Ghanaian citizenship. And um, that was just even um, less than the original number he had intended to give, which is 252, but only about 126 were available to take up that citizenship. So we are still yet with the you know, remainder 126 or thereabout that we intend to also go ahead and confer the citizenship on, the Ghanaian citizenship. We have said so much about how successful this event or this program was for the year 2019. The high success of the year points to the diaspora integration within the national fabric, the nation building, and the acceptance of Ghana by the diaspora as an entry point, as I've said, into Africa. Tourism was highly impacted as all upmarket hotels were booked in December during the year of return. 
International travels into the country also saw a steady growth from about 900,000 in 2018 to well over 1 million in 2019 and 18.19, 18.19% increase. Moreover, Ghana also earned international media spotlight. The year of return was covered over a thousand times by television, prints, radio, and online media sources. Also, the spend of tourists increased from 2,708 USD to over 2,931 USD per tourist in 2019. This increase, as well as increase in the number of travelers, positively impacted private sector industries, such as airlines, hotel tour operators, restaurants, textiles, art and craft dealers, to name but a few. Okay. Um, was... Mr. Ababio, I'm so sorry to interrupt because this is just an introductory session and you are going to speak again um, just after the... Um, the perform the word yeah. uh, word performance and so we really find this very interesting and look forward to listening to to you more in detail so we can keep that for the next session if you don't mind that was very really, thank you yeah, That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. we're looking thank forward you. to to the return here for yes. a while so yes, yes. yeah yes. great thank you so much so i appreciate that um i'm now going to ask um um quick to uh, ask um and welcome Mr. Onyakachi Wambu, um, who's a veteran a journalist, a very well-known voice in the African diaspora on, on development. He's executive director of the African Foundation for Development Afford um, and a broadcaster, former journalist, documentary maker. He's worked extensively in Africa and I've also had the privilege to work with him many, some years ago. So um, welcome, Mr. Onyekachi Bambu, and um, we look forward to your input. Thank you. Um, thank you, June. Um, I want to, first of all, thank our partners for this important event, um, the AU CEDO and the UN FPA. I also want to thank the panelists who will shortly share their knowledge and policy proposals and best practice in a number of these areas. And June, I wanted to thank you as moderator. Uh, and then finally, the audience who have given up their time to attend this uh, really important meeting. Um, Afford is a, a UK-based charity with a mission to expand and enhance the contributions that Africans in the diaspora make to Africa's development. And we see these contributions at sixfold, which is the time that the diaspora spend doing this work, our financial capital that we deploy, intellectual capital, our social capital, our political cap capital, and finally, our cultural capital. So Ford's work has been involved in mobilizing all these different uh, forms of capital for development in Africa. And we have programs to support diaspora investment into job creating SMEs, and on the cultural front, um, the return of the ICOMS program, which we're currently uh, running to support the return of looted African artifacts in Western cultural institutions. On that front, this week has seen some dramatic movement with Germany now saying that it will restitute all its spending bronzes um, in all of its cultural institutions. And today we heard the University of Aberdeen announce that they would return their sole Benin bronze to Nigeria. And we're hoping that this will now create the momentum that we need for all our cultural um, artifacts that are in Western museums to go back. And th these are really important because we'll hear more about the year of return. But when I was in Ghana in 2019, you go to the castles, you have a, a really, anguishing experience of um, dispossession and trauma. And then you want to know what is it that Ghana was before this experience? And you go to the local museums and, and, then, and that heritage is actually in Western museums. So there's a, a link um, to all of this work that we're doing. So why is it that this culture 
cultural work matters. Um, the iconic freedom fighter, as we've heard, and theorist um, um, Cabral, who did a huge amount to rid the continent of uh, Portuguese colonialism, noted in his famous speech on the role of indigenous culture and national liberation, that the value of culture as an element of resistance to foreign domination lies in the fact that culture is simultaneously the fruit of a people's history and the determinant of history. He also noted on the purposes of national culture that we should always bear in mind that the people are not fighting merely for ideas, for the things in anyone's head. They're fighting to win material benefit, to live better and in peace and to see their lives go forward. And to get my takeaway from Cabral is that we must explicitly and imaginatively harness our culture and our heritage in all aspects. Um, African human creativity and endeavor and its interaction with the diverse environments on the continent. And we must harness all of this to construct our common future. So I'm happy that this event is happening within the context of history and the International Day of Remembrance uh, of the enslaved victims of the transatlantic horrors and also in the context of the UN decade of African people, uh, people of African descent. Both speak to the recovery of the African world after 400 year, a 400 year period of enslavement and colonialism um, and the attendant structural legacies that, of, of racism and uh, economic under, under development and inequalities that have been left as a result. And now we also have COVID, which has again starkly exposed those inequalities that I just mentioned. But as Cabral hinted, culture is also resistance and it has played a role before in our fight back. I have begun talking of the 10 Rs, which policy frameworks should consider because they are part of the reckoning now by the black and African world of the damaging impact and structural legacies of slavery and colonialism. The 10 Rs have frequently developed organizational uh, organizations and movements of their own but they also quite often work as a continuum of one broader movement, seeking first of all recognition and acknowledgement of the injustice and crimes of slavery and colonialism. And we know that that's a, a huge barrier because we know in the world that there's still people who won't acknowledge what happened. Uh, and then the second are the remembrance of the victims. And today we are beginning to do that. And then the restoration of African dignity as a third, and then the restitution of our physical artifacts and human remains as a fourth are. And then the financial and psychological reparations and healing that uh, we, are, we need to embark on as well. Uh, followed by the mental and active reconciliation within the severed global African world and the reconnections that um, um, our Ghanaian initiative just referred to, to reconnect with uh, the, the severed parts of our our body. And then the physical and human return as has been achieved by the Rastafarians in Ethiopia and many others now who are looking at new possibilities for resettling in, in, the, in the continent from the diaspora. And then the final two hours, which is how we reimagine our future possibilities and renew and reconstruct our African societies so that we can lead to what the AU in the 2063 agenda seek, which is an African Renaissance. I'll end by saying that the 10 hours are a reassertion of, that, of the African cultural narrative, um, where victims are being remembered and spoken about, where requests are being made for artifacts to once again fill our, our institutions as a basis for heritage tourism, where our human remains that remain captured abroad are returned, our iconic liberators like the Zimbabwean four who fought British colonialism and their heads are in a box somewhere in, in a British cultural institution. These icons are returned where the statues of cruel oppressors are in the frame as we saw during the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations in the UK and where we seek to decolonize text um, and also exalt African uh, contributions and we ask excavate and return this once more to the corpus of human knowledge. So history and the future of African agency is being reborn. All these forms the basis for a new scope for cultural intervention and engagement 
within the African world itself and between the African world and the broader global family, especially in the realms of economic, scientific, historic, political, social, and environmental sectors. Um, I look forward to hearing the best practice um, in the next session and how we can build on this and uh, seek to have much more learning and integrated initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Onye Kachi, for really anchoring us in what it means to return, the return of the icons, the return of all those things and people who are still in Europe who need to come home and um, beyond the metaphor of returning. And on that very thought-provoking note from Ford's executive director, Mr. Onya Kachi Vambu, we conclude this opening session. Um, already key themes are emerging as we reflect on implications for policy in this dialogue, in which some issues have been identified quite pertinently by our eminent speakers, our excellencies, um, and, um, you know, drawing, as I said earlier, on decades of experiences, um, so it's not just, you know, thoughts um, and insights and uh, uh, insights on work in culture and economics and health and human rights, uh, women's movements um, that they've been doing and with children as well. We now are going to call so on for a short um, performance um, video that um, Royala will put up for us before we move into the next session um, for the panel discussion. What does it mean to return in terms of policy um, going forward in a post COVID world of working stronger together? So um, if we can just have the video, please. Thank you. From the south, to the east, to the west, and all the way to the south part of the motherland, we are sons and daughters of Emir of Shonga. We are travelers. We carry our name on our feet. We are kings and queens of Bungada. Kirikirona Dinjovu. We carry our names with the beat on our feet. Ribabolong, Bakwena, Batapimba Sakwana, Lebaha. We are Sambu, North Butterflies. And I, I stand on the backs of those who are called Bahanka, singing songs that the rain and the winds never whispered to Dinuka. Badimubaka waiting to be praised with the buzz of the bees, the beats of the drums, they turn to my unsaid choruses. I stride on shoes of giants, creating the legacy of their quest, embracing their names in verses, reflecting their voluptuous looks on lakes, pulling their strings from Khalakhari, placing them on Gura Ba Africa. We are some guru, not butterflies glittering with diamonds attached to our wings. Living after Asian tells our souls are wrapped in long wedding shawls. We, the wise ones who speak in riddles where our words pass through village gossip metaphors. Our lands are marked by chocolate pebbles and pale skies. These lands where warriors ride effortlessly over rocks, striding easily across long life distance. And in the night of wisdom, we sing in puzzles. We come out of our cocoons like little babies covered with life. We jump like butterflies that have reached their glory. Our sounds travel far on the still air of storytelling and spell dance. We sleep with darkness calling our names. At dawn, the rays of the rising sun kisses our lips as Virgo the morning star make out our footprint. We are some guru, not butterflies, the stringing cords from ancestors, tars moving, songs of time. Itiakosha! Gitwakapina as the forest echoes our clan names. We 
the same people constantly in search of the grazing sun. Our red veins mark the soil and the split our worship dances with the safari snakes. And we are merely travelers. We carry our names with the beat on our feet. We chant freedom, freedom, freedom. Beautiful, thank you. That was riveting and powerful. The woman of Africa, the intangible, the powerful. We cannot separate the intangible from the tangible. And I think COVID-19 has amplified that uh, realization. Thank you. We now move into the panel and the reflections on the role of cultural heritage and tourism sectors in building forward better post-COVID-19. Now, esteemed panelists are well-known practitioners in the field. Um, Mr. Akwasi Ababio, that you've just met in the first uh, panel uh, discussion, um, sorry, the first session, Ghana, from Ghana, and Ms. Alexandra Cummins Barbados, also a very well-known figure in the field of culture uh, globally and with UNESCO. Uh, Ms. Malema Moloya, very well-known South African, uh, the future, the, 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 the young people, the innovation, the, crea the creative future for Africa. Um, and Ms. Abdul Karim Abdullah, um, very wonderful wonderful energetic um, interventions in culture on the continent. So we have met Mr. Ababeo uh, in the first uh, session, so I'm not going to introduce him again. Um, so welcome Mr. Ababeo to this session uh, for your um, input. Um, and um, just a reminder, we've got to keep in, on the time. Um, the session has to end at 10 to 4, and um, some speakers will get a bit longer than others. Um, Mr. Babio um, had a session, <laughs> had time in the first session. So in this session, um, the balance of that time, which is about seven minutes, um, and um, we're interested to hear further about the Ghana Year of Return, uh, heritage economic impact, and Ghana as a site of pilgrimage, and how we can build he uh, heritage and offer restituted artifacts. Uh, over to you, Mr. Ababio. Yeah, thank you once more for the opportunity to you know, uh, share our experience with the August uh, Assembly. I think um, I've already begun by, uh, telling us uh, about uh, what we did and how the people came in and how you know we had enjoyed this um, media coverage all throughout the world. I think it's, um, I could just go straight to the point where we would um, look at some of the, you know, our time, headline things that also happened during that time, that there were some major community impacts, which included commission of boreholes, you know, and uh, we also had the opportunity to work collaboratively with them um, on the Joseph project between ourselves, Ghana, Barbados, and Jamaica to produce that film, Joseph. So that was a very big one for us in respect of, you know, bringing the countries together. And then we also had the opportunity to also do uh, give the, some medical practitioners from the diaspora to do some medical outreach in the country. You know, when they visited places that were notoriously lacking uh, medical services uh, um, to, you know, basically bring some medical uh, attention and facilities to that community. Then we also had, you know, there was an impact as far as we were concerned on our visa process previously we had paid little attention to our visa process and how we needed to use that opportunity to you know, get people to come in as easily as possible. So those uh, issues that people had with the visa acquisition were addressed during the time when we, we had to you know, uh, encourage people to come in. And uh, there was an ease of visa application. We saw the Ministry of Foreign Affairs reduce the cost of visa on arrival from 150 USD to 
um, 75 USD. The Foreign Affairs also issued a directive allowing individuals to receive their visa upon arrival in Ghana without prior approval. The president also announced reciprocal visa waiver agreements with Jamaica. And these are the things that you know, we did among ourselves with other African countries, our Afri diasporan original, uh, originating countries to basically enable us to you know, whip up the, 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 the flow of the passengers or the flow of tourists or the flow of diasporans coming to Ghana. But that is not to say the year of return didn't have its challenges. We had serious challenges. And uh, one of the major ones that we had was in respect of lack of you know, funding. There was limited government resource for the organization of the event and the preparation sites for high profile visitors. And um, as a result, the campaign, the steering committee promoted private sector participation, which led to about 70% of events being self-funded and organized by private companies with um, the steering committee playing a coordination and a facilitating role. So prospective event organizers, many of whom were initially expected to you know, obtain something, funding, et cetera, for government, <laughs> were, 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 were rather disappointed and that they had to look for their resources, look for the funding to still go ahead with their programs. And thank God everything ended up successfully. There was also miscommunication and misinformation, notably via social media, that led to many to believe that they could travel to Ghana visa-free. So, and um, for some, that was a big issue that they were confronted with the acquisition of visa to come to Ghana. So long term, we are looking to see how we can also address this. And uh, several other key events also experienced a low attendance rate due to event organizers pricing tickets higher than what the average Ghanaian could afford. And uh, you know, most people, when they had come into the country, had friends that they would like to go to places with. So when the ordinary Ghanaian himself cannot afford those things, you know, it had an impact on the events that were being organized. And we've learned a lot, we are as a whole, whereas we have a huge learning opportunity. For example, the year of return event attracted individuals from around the world, international bodies that needed the ability to receive and update information and purchase tickets to attend events online. So that is something that we have to, you know, be able to grapple with in the future the very near future. In several instances, information about tickets were not available far enough to advance for international attendees. And moving forward, we are going to have to address and to reduce some frustrations of you know, event attendants, attendees who are also, you know, who, need, who used to be an online world, who are used to the online world. Health and safety are very important at all events. And in the future, we will ensure that all events have an abundance and medical staff on site. And then um, also we are looking to see how the return must also you know, enable people to adjust to our people. Our art and artifacts in many ways serve as part of our memory and are the integral part of the culture and the heritage. And we should be looking to see how but along this, um, whereas we have some here that people can come and enjoy, we should be joining forces with our international communities that are looking to see how we can impress upon our colonial masters and others who are holding our artifacts to also return these artifacts back home so that other, you know, we can enjoy it whilst we are also, you know, coming back home and should be coming back home with all the artifacts that were taken away from us. So there's a brief one, I suppose, at this stage, and uh, basically. You know, I'm available to also contribute in other respects, but uh, for now, this is what I want to add. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ababio. Uh, practical and um, very inspirational. We always look to Ghana um, in, in, in many ways historically, so very much inspired. Um, uh, and that was Mr. Ababio, Director of Diaspora Affairs, Office of the President, Lead for the Ghana Diaspora Engagement Policy. Um, we now call on Ms. Alessandra Cummins uh, from Barbados. Um, I've introduced her, but just to say, she's Director of Barbados Museum and Historical Society, Chairperson of UNESCO Executive Board, um, and um, she's done extensive work on museums to share with us. Over to you, 
and Isandra. Thank you so much for that introduction and um, Excellencies, colleagues, friends, thank you so much for that very inspiring opening ceremony. My presentation on diasporic representation as an act of reclaiming our African heritage is basically framed within the statement by Michel Rautrio, which reminds us about the, the silences that have surrounded our processes of historical production at four crucial moments, the making of the sources, the making of the archives, the making of the narratives, and the making of history in the final instance. And it is something that we have to constantly remind ourselves, particularly in a um, context of museum making and site interpretation at all times. I've been asked to give you a short, a short introduction to some of the key policy frameworks that uh, inform this presentation and inform our action around this notion of reconnecting with our African heritage, our colleagues, our roots, and to, to look at the ways in which um, one government has been seeking to do this. Um, my, my pre, my, the previous speakers already referenced a number of instances where Barbados, Jamaica, and um, Ghana have worked together to achieve certain goals. In um, November of 2020, Barbados's Prime Minister, uh, Mia Motley, in, opens an inaugural um, Caribbean pivot event by urging the people of the Caribbean to, her to harness their cultural confidence and creative imagination to allow the region to secure its place as a world leader in technology and innovation. This was also uh, tied to a number of other initiatives, including digitization of resources, um, the development of new and um, innovative strategies for tourism, not least in looking at South-South uh, connections in terms of our audiences and not the traditional ones where we look to Northern European and um, American-based audiences. So innovative tourism and the need to connect with those kinds of audiences mm -hmm. has also informed a number of activities. In um, the middle image, you see uh, the, the return as, as um, instituted by Prime Minister Motley of uh, certain remains from our burial ground um, for internment at Asin Manso with the remains of draped in a Barbados flag. At the same time, we look at very, very um, instructive and innovative sources through the schools where our long-term uh, national commission um, of uh, Pan our National Pan-African Commission introduced a program called the Babalozi Schools Program within schools and also developed through the cooperative agreements that we are institution now with Kenya as well. A specific um, area of um, policy making that relates to this particular uh, conference is the establishment of a ministry specifically linking to the, the creative economy, culture and heritage, uh, which focus on appreciation and development and monetization of inherited cultural skills and setting policy to promote cultural and creative industries. So when we talk about uh, the, the creative industries, we look at the ways in which we can harness these in the context in which we work um, and key considerations and recommendations for this audience include understanding um, Africa beyond stereotypes and westernized tropes, understanding how African art, culture and heritage has passed down um, and spread intergenerationally across the world through migration and forced migrations of peoples of African nations. Multivocality, which includes the voices of the global South, wherever they are represented in the diaspora. Shared research and multivocality of interpretation, creating opportunities for mutual learning, 
co-curation of content from the diaspora and through the encouragement of strong professional community um, and policy-based uh, connections and cooperation, partnership cooperation, and the application of constructivist learning models, which make room and hold space for the incorporation of traditional and inherited ways of learning and meaning, making uh, meaning making, which may not fit into the authorized heritage discourse, but is it not time to change that authorized heritage discourse into something that is specific for our African nations? To begin with, let me just um, say to you that the museum, my museum, which is now 90 years old, has had started this process a long time ago, relatively speaking. It incorporated collections of African heritage and it developed its uh, gallery of um, the African gallery of the museum, which was based on exploring the vastness of Africa, African arts, culture and heritage. It highlighted the achievements of um, African nations and leaders. It highlighted diversity of um, peoples coming into the Caribbean. And it spoke very specifically about rewriting history, rewriting history on our own terms as stressed by Michel Rolf Priel. What I want to stress is that this gallery also was a deliberate decision of the museum to emphasize and to, uh, uh, and to put in its own space African history and heritage, because we did not want for the story of African history and heritage to be told solely through the lens of slavery, which was not where it originated. And this was a very important educational mission and tool because this gallery is one of the single most important African-based resources um, in Barbados available to schools and students. We have also undertaken a number of missions. Um, research is a, of critical importance alongside the educational and public programming aspects of the museum. The commemoration of the Route 2 Atlantic crossings from Morocco to Barbados um, was a critically important tool. We included amongst the um, amongst the speakers for that particular event, uh, an authority, one of the great authorities on the notion of African um, transmission to the Caribbean before Columbus, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Solomon, uh, Professor Adu, who was able to help place the notion of um, this, uh, this 20th century uh, recognition of the, the Atlantic crossing to pre-Columbian times, which was a very important notion to undertake. At the same time, the museum has um, included lectures and presentations on, for example, Barbadian migration to Liberia, on the development of the um, African Ethiopian church in the Caribbean and in Barbados specifically, we were privileged to welcome um, His Grace Abuna Tadeus Gide, formerly Abe, Abba Wolde, um, Gabriel Wolde Selassie, um, and spiritual and anthropological collections through, for example, a presentation on Sankofa, the Barbados Ghana collect connection by Reverend Solomon Odum. Um, so a number of different initiatives around the spreading of new knowledge and information about the connections between Barbados and Africa are undertaken through an, an ongoing and engaging um, public history and educational experience. We also though take, um, take the time and the effort to work through uh, making uh, and developing new narratives and perspectives which engage with um, and interrogate the existing stereotypes, such as the, the, uh, the ways in which African people have been, um, sorry, African people have been presented through Western eyes in the series of portraits. 
And we make the time and effort through our exhibitions that very deliberately um, displace uh, earlier notions of how African people have um, survived and thrived within the new environment, particularly from the 17th century onwards into the 19th and early 20th century, and seek to uh, explore and to explain to our audiences how to reread images such as the ones that you see here, which are form part of our collection, but also through developing of shared exhibitions with other um, owners and collectors of images which are critically important and which have not been otherwise seen. So right now, this exhibition, The Black Presence, Activism and Agency from a Different Age is currently in our galleries. We also um, work uh, across the board with developing, uh, again, a closer understanding of um, the ways in which to celebrate uh, national heroes, uh, most of whom are descended from the African diaspora and who have contributed to our national development and identity. This um, has been an ongoing um, exploration, particularly with our historians at the University of the West Indies, who have rewritten the story, the silenced histories of many individuals who are now our national heroes. So uh, Sarah Ann Gill, Samuel Jackman Prescott, uh, uh, Bassa, um, King Jaja, all of whom form part of our national narrative are, and part of our history making have also um, been the basis of uh, uh, localized presentations, uh, exhibitions, and um, uh, publications uh, as far as these uh, critical stories that need to be told to our audiences are concerned. We've also um, participated in important events, uh, both in terms of our European uh, heritage, but our European heritage with a difference because um, the museum and the University of the West Indies were engaged in a four-year uh, research program called EU Latin Museums, which created opportunities for mutual learning and development of best practice in research and interpretation and dissemination. Um, the Enigma of Arrival, the Politics and Poetics of Caribbean Migration to Britain was a particularly important event because it allowed us to reconnect with our Barbadian diaspora in the UK and to ensure that multiple voices were um, engaged with and were unlearned on earth and given new relevance within the context of this exhibition, which exists in uh, both a poster form and a virtual form in digital forms and has been enthusiastically taken up and utilized by different audiences, both in the Caribbean and in the UK. Other audiences uh, also appreciated another exhibition called Arrivance, Art of Migration in the Anglophone Caribbean World, where both Caribbean and UK artists of African descent explored and interrogated the issues around um, images such as Nelson um, shown um, as reconfigured -con and reimagined by um, uh, UK artist, renowned artist Hugh Locke. And uh, we don't have time to go into the detail of the symbolism, but if you look carefully at the um, role of uh, ironworks that fall at the base of this uh, sculpture, you will see that he has reimagined European ironwork in the form of Africans who were in the um, loaded into the hold of, of um, European ships and brought to the Caribbean. Finally, from, uh, from this uh, uh, project, we had a series of lectures from invitation to deportation, 70 years of the Windrush generation in which uh, various speakers um, from the university in particular, but from other resources, including um, media development, um, musicians and um, 
literary, literary uh, professionals explored different as aspects of what that connection and legacy meant, the Windrush legacy meant uh, in the context of the Caribbean. Uh, what's happening here? I want to uh, point out that we don't just deal with um, lectures and research, although that's very rigorous research lies at the basis of much of what we do, but we do utilize our spaces, which are seriously um, uh, colonialized spaces, which we have to constantly fight against um, by producing a number of theatrical performances based on historical evidence, which students at the uh, Barbados Community College then take and reinterpret uh, in a number of performances, including Millie really Gone to Brazil, Bad Jan, Cover Down Your, Your Bucket, Bush Memories that looked at the ways in which um, Obia and Bush Medicine um, have become incorporated now into Caribbean um, and Barbadian um, uh, culture cultural traditions, traditional theater and storytelling, um, traditional and hybridized dance, costume, and music. So the space of the museum is also utilized by other audiences and traditions. But we also um, work Sorry in... to interrupt, Ms. Cummins. Um, if you can bring it to a close, please. That will be... Uh, we, okay, I, I do need to reach to the end though in order to make the point. Um, the, okay. we, have worked with, um, we have worked with African, um, often UK based artists, John Comfort, who will be known, uh, the filmographer who will be known to a number of you, has engaged in um, the development of Auto da Fe, which was created within the Barbados landscape, which is a dual uh, screen interpretation, and Sonia Boyce, who has Barbadian roots as well as um, Guyanese roots, has also worked with us on the development of um, her uh, film interpretation called Crop Over. Um, I do want to um, get to, why can't I move on from the screen? I want to, um, bring the last two screens that I want to show you are uh, uh, telling you about the importance of archaeology, because although it is viewed as um, uh, very much Europeanized, it has allowed us to explore different uh, areas of relevance about how we understand our African roots. So the exploration of Trent's cave, for example, on Trent's plantation, allows us to understand that while Barbadian and the Barbadian slave could not escape to the mountains as did their Jamaican maroon colleagues, they escaped to underground caverns where they were producing stone, um, metal, a lot of steel and ironworks, which are ultimately part of a uh, probably a Nigerian tradition, which is not has has not really been explored in Barbados before. And this uh, um, glass object, this eight pointed stone, points to ways and means in which um, the Barbadian slaves sought to escape and to resist um, the the um, context of colonial. Uh, restrictions. Finally, um, at the Newton Bioground site, we have um, uncovered, although it's 30 to 40 years old, uncovered this very important site, which is the only um, enslaved bioground of any um, significance. Over 500 individuals are in this which links directly the, the, the material heritage that has been uncovered links directly to um, ritual and burial traditions that were brought with the enslaved, including artifacts which were not produced in carriage, which were brought with them and which were buried with them in the soil of Barbados. And we now see a growing interest um, amongst both the Barbadian and the diasporic community mm -hmm to take pilgrimages to the site in order to reconnect with their African heritage. 
Um, so we are very much looking forward to developing the knowledge and the engagement of the community with this very, very important site through the development of digital, as well as um, the development of new uh, education and ultimately tourism related resources, providing we can um, create the kind of contemplative center um, uh, of pilgrimage that we want to see as part of the, the Africa Thank you. we want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Cummins, um, Director of Barbados Museum and Historical Society, um, got us to think about the ritual archive. It's just one of the areas I could listen to very clearly. Um, we don't have much time, and so I'm terribly sorry if we're cutting okay. into other time, but um, now calling on Ms. Molema Mohoila of South Africa, Head of Research at Andani, um, where she co-leads the Open Restitution Project. She's, and she does a lot of collaborative artwork that one can find and exciting things um, on the internet. So over to you, Molema. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, try and keep it short so we can have some time for conversation. Um, but really just a few musings based on particularly some experiences last year with the Open Restitution Project um, around some of the kind of possibilities of the future. So I'm going to share a brief um, video with everyone and then um, very briefly kind of give you a bit of a sense of um, what some thoughts might be towards a kind of um, engagement with African heritage and the digital space to some degree as well. Um, so I will play this video for you to begin with. So the Open Restitution Africa project is um, a collaboration between myself and Chao uh, Taina Maina, um, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and together we have um, been conducting this uh, kind of research process uh, really aimed at two things. One, enabling a kind of Africa-centered conversation and Africa to Africa-centered conversation around restitution. Um, and two, uh, enabling sort of greater transparency and openness around the restitution conversation. Um, much of the conversation that happens around restitution tends to be a very brief press release that we see in the news about a potential return, but very little um, other engagement in terms of the con con complexities of restitution. Um, and so the project started last year and is still very much in its beginning phases. Um, but I think last year was a very interesting experience for us um, in terms of thinking about particularly the impacts of COVID and thinking through what restitution could mean for the African continent. And I think Mr. Wambo has already spoken to this in, in quite substantial detail. Um, but effectively last year, um, we were faced with the, the need to kind of continue our work um, even though we were limited by the, the, um, the, the pandemic. And um, two parts of, of this project, I think, kind of represent some of the contradictions that come from the African continent. Um, on the one hand, the African continent has only 1% of the world digital economy and only about 27 to 30% internet access across the continent. Um, in my context in South Africa, there've been protests particularly around um, student access to um, tertiary education because of um, uh, the high costs of data and the difficulty of accessing the internet um, in a very unequal um, context. 
And so on the one side, Africa isn't necessarily associated with digital, but on the other hand, um, uh, the African continent is one of the few places in the world that has over 100% mobile usage in much of the continent. Many of us have more than one cell phone. Um, we're also the world's largest share of adults with mobile money accounts, um, and we're the world's fastest um, or, or highest increasing um, continent in terms of e-connectivity. So we're definitely an increasingly digitizing space and we kind of managed to hold uh, this hyper digitized and, and yet at the same time struggling for access sort of space within the continent for digital access. Um, and in a similar way, actually, there's a kind of contradiction around heritage on the African continent. Um, we kind of associate the African continent, and I think particularly within sort of diaspora discourse, um, with heritage, with history, um, with a kind of um, proud sense and connectivity to a history. And yet, um, at least 90% of our material heritage was removed from the continent um, before and during colonialism. And in fact, much of our material heritage con continues to be taken from the continent. And so on a day where we're remembering um, the victims of slavery and the, the this history of slavery, um, we also remember that in fact, um, we've also had uh, so much uh, material heritage taken from the continent as well. Um, and we are faced with this kind of question of um, return, meaning uh, not just for the diaspora, but even for Africans ourselves, uh, a, a reconnection and a, and a searching for um, an origin, a history, a knowledge about ourselves and our histories. Um, and for Chow and myself, a big question becomes kind of how do young people operate between these multiple contradictions? Um, and just as a, a kind of quick introduction to uh, an example of what this can potentially mean, one of the projects we ran last year was a series of discussions, um, uh, open dialogues around the restitution conversation. And um, uh, as far as we know, this is one of very few uh, conversations that brings Africans in particular to speak about restitution together without Europeans involved or, or North Americans involved. Um, it did have a very strong African diaspora in attendance and otherwise a very strong African audience in attendance um, and enabled a really quite rich space of conversation around the restitution conversation. Um, but also importantly, very much bringing young people to the table around this conversation. And as you can see also very excitingly, women to this conversation. Um, and uh, this kind of um, connection across the continent, across both Anglophone and Af um, Francophone Africa as well, um, is the kind of thing that can be quite difficult to do in Africa and particularly for younger practitioners. Um, and in fact, COVID kind of enabled us to think a little bit beyond what we might have otherwise historically and made it much easier um, to connect um, and to use the sort of digital format to bring these um, range of different people together over um, a, a couple of months of discussions. Um, and even though, of course, we still struggle with much of the sort of difficulty of digital connection, um, in many ways, I think we've become much, and, and I'm sure many people would have this experience in, in many elements of our work, much more aware of what becomes possible um, with, with the digital and with the ability to engage digitally. Um, and particularly in the case of this project, which is completely self-funded by myself and Chow, um, with very low um, 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 income and investment in the project. Uh, digital enables us to do quite great things. Um, and the, the conversations, I think, importantly brought together a range of really important localized projects and then continentalized them and then connected them to the African diaspora as well. And this kind of multi-leveled work, I think, is super important for how we might understand restitution's impact on the continent. Um, so, for example, the Zambian Women's History Museum is an incredible uh, sort of independent history museum being developed um, in Lusaka um, and doing some really interesting work, particularly around digital restitution um, and developing really fascinating um, video, easy access animated video works available on YouTube, a podcast, really 
making sure that women's histories are being told from the African perspective um, and being made more visible for particularly young Africans um, and, and the diaspora more broadly. Uh, Nana Oforiata Ayim runs an incredible alternative museum project um, based in Accra primarily, but it's a traveling museum so it can move around, really testing the kind of colonial inheritance of museum practice and trying to think about what, what are the contexts that we're bringing these objects back to uh, what are the kinds of educational spaces that they might connect to, the kinds of communities that they might connect to, and what are the modalities that we can think through to enable this return to have true value to the African continent. Um, the NEST in, in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, when Joaquin Gumi is based, doing some very similar um, engagements with what it means to return objects to the African continent, or how are the ways that we then um, reconnect with this incredible loss um, of history and trying to refine and reclaim um, a kind of identity and heritage, particularly for young Africans who have been so um, distinctly separated from a lot of this history. Um, and, and, and bringing these kinds of uh, quite localized projects that are happening very much um, in even neighborhoods and smaller communities um, to a kind of continental level where we can sort of share expertise and learn from each other and, and, and share conversations, but particularly share conversations that maybe um, are difficult to have with the European <laughs> table um, that can start to really have a conversation about some of the really difficult elements of what restitution might mean on the African continent, um, but also to center in less on trying to make an argument for the fact that restitution is necessary because we take this as given, but rather to have a conversation about what we want restitution to do for ourselves. And I think as Mr. Wambo already said, um, the future of African agency is being reborn. I thought this was a really strong statement. Um, and I think there is a lot of potential that uh, particularly young people might be able to uh, reframe and rethink what this agency means in relation to restitution and African heritage um, as we move into this new space where things are starting to be returned and we are able to define and claim what that means for ourselves. Um, so I'll stop there because I know we don't have a lot of time um, and hand over back to you, Jill. Thank you so much, Molimo. Um, African Futurism, Innovative Strategies for Restitution, the Youthful Continent, um, the biggest uh, youth um, section, um, wonderful um, capacities, and what are those strategies um, that we can take forward with the African Union and the UN. Um, I now call on um, Mr. Abdul, Karim Abdullah, um, founder and chief executive officer of Culture Management Group, CMG, and Afro Chella Festival. Um, wonderful work, and we look forward to, to hearing your input. Uh, thank you so much for addressing us in your role as cultural entrepreneur in using African heritage and culture to develop an audience within Africa and the African diaspora. Over to you, Abdul. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Um, greetings to all distinguished guests. Um, I wanted to take the time to, to talk about our festival, Afrochella Festival, and our company, Culture Management Group, and what we do. And um, I do have two short videos that I would like to share with you just to kind of give you an overall sense of, uh, of how we make our attendees feel um, and the type of experiences that we try to create. Um, I appreciate all the, the previous talkers. I think that it was important for me to be able to hear that. And it, it further encourages our goals and our missions that the, uh, that the goal and the experiment that we tried to create about five years ago is being enforced on so many different levels from a policy level to a creative standpoint and to a cross country diaspora conversations like this. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I do want to share my screen to showcase our, you know, a little bit of introduction about Afrochella. Um, uh, we've been in existence for about five years now, and we started off in, in Accra, Ghana, about two years before the year of return. Um, so like Mr. Babio mentioned a little earlier, Afrochella was one of the key events for Ghana's year of return in 2019. And a lot of the videos that I will be sharing are around 2019, but I felt it's important for me to kind of um, give you an understanding of our, um, who we are and our mantra. Uh, sorry, one second. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, these three things I, I think divine us. Uh, we feel that we are a bridge between the diaspora and the continent and the type of events and the, um, the cultural uh, space that we create. 
Uh, we want to use our, our agency to kind of redefine the perception. So telling our own stories uh, from our own perspectives, from the continental uh, perspective, and also to leverage our agency to amplify voices uh, through partnerships. Um, some of the partnerships that we've had uh, is Twitter's first ever uh, activation in West Africa and Accra, Ghana, as well as with AudioMac to create a Rise and Star Challenge to provide uh, rising music and talent an opportunity to compete uh, to win studio time and, and some and some money as well for 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 the type of work that they create. Uh, this is our team. Um, obviously, I'm the leader of the team, but I just wanted to kind of let you know what our diverse team is. And our team spans across the US, uh, UK, as well as in Ghana. Majority of our team, I would say about 60% of our team reside in Ghana um, and, um, and are very diverse. So what do we exist for? Our goal is to create opportunities for generation Africans to, to celebrate and narrate uh, I document our native cultures. I, I think one of the, the, um, the recurring themes that we've heard here is that that need to take back that voice to be able to kind of be the ones that tell our own story uh, to the world. And Afrochella takes that approach very, very seriously in the, the creatives that we hire and the companies that we work with. So in the past, we've worked with designers like Alara from Nigeria. We've worked with artists uh, like Serge, um, Serge Clote, who is currently doing um, uh, who's currently doing activation at Desert X. Uh, we've worked with artists like uh, Godwin, Godwin um, Achon, who, who is a esteemed uh, production agent in, in Accra, Ghana. Uh, we, we want to be a bridge between the diaspora and the continent uh, and, and the way that we've done and, and connecting people through our four pillars, which are music, food, and fashion and art as well, which we think are like the common things that, that bring commonality between us and the people around the world. Like we all love planting across the world, right? Whether you're in the Caribbean or Ghana or um, uh, anywhere else where the diaspora resides. And as well, use our agency to kind of figure out a way to bring the people that we uh, encourage to visit Ghana and Africa where we decide to activate next uh, into our effort to kind of give back to the community um, in, in the ways that we've done. Uh, thus far, we've we built schools, uh, we've given school supplies to different community um, agencies, and we've also given sponsorships in addition to the competition that we run around music and for various creators. Um, this is our growth over the past couple of years. Over the, um, we've been able to experience exponential growth. So this tells me that if we put out a call to action to people within the diaspora to come to the continent and celebrate culture, celebrate us, they will come. Uh, we started off in 2017, as Dr. Ababio mentioned, with no support. And uh, up until now, five years later, although our numbers have exponentially grown, we still haven't been able to kind of secure the funding to keep these uh, initiative going. Uh, we started off with about 4,700 uh, in 2019. We saw a little over 6,500 people in attendance. And due to COVID uh, last year, we were able to kind of take a lot of our efforts digitally and we were able to broadcast across Ghana. Uh, we had up to 15,000 people digitally, but we were able to kind of create a social distance space in Ghana where we had uh, a few people in attendance as well. This is our demographics. Um, I think this was very important. One of, the, one of the things that mentioned is where are people coming from? What is the experience that they would like to have? Um, who are they and how is it that we can connect to them? So Afrochella as a company has been very uh, interested in data and, and, and getting feedback from our people about their experiences when they, when they do visit Ghana and where they're coming from, what they expect, what did, what did they experience that they, um, uh, what they expected and what they didn't expect and, and, and what is it that they will carry with going forward. So I thought it was very important for us to kind of show you our data because this is something that we collect uh, via our website with the permission of our audience as well. And anywhere that has a watermark with our Afrochella logo represents um, areas where people come from. So anywhere from the US to UK, across Asia, across Africa, uh, the Caribbean and South America as well. Um, and their interests vary, right, uh, across a, a span of different things and the incomes of people that are coming also are in a pretty good place. Um, and uh, because of the efforts that we've been able to put together, we've been able to kind of gain a lot of uh, media coverage uh, from Allure to CNN. We've been interviewed on uh, different radio stations across the world about our experience and people's feedback towards our experience that we've been able to create. Um, so with that said, I, I just felt that it was important. I also share a video um, that kind of gives you some insight into who we are and the feeling that we create as well. Let's just make this larger. Start off as a music festival. 
So music is a component, right? And we feel that it's equally as important as the fashion is important. And in my, in my mentality of my team, what we decided was that if people can understand each piece of these, they have a better understanding of our culture. just kind of a brief overview of what our event kind of feels like and, and, and the experience that it's able to create. Uh, one of the things that we thought was pretty interesting that was in 2019, we had travelers from all over the world, as I mentioned earlier, but it was interesting that our call to action um, invited people who for the first time ever were traveling outside of their residence, as in the first time they got a passport, they came to Ghana. And, and for us, that was very special. That told us that if there was a pilgrimage and if they had that, that, that type of encouragement um, or familiarity with the type of experiences that we were creating for them, that they would be able to be willing to come. I do have one last video, which kind of also, uh, you know, gives you an understanding into uh, the type of experiences that we provide our audience. Not only do they give them opportunity to come um, and party, but they also get an opportunity to experience Ghana um, and, and the different tourism um, uh, tourism opportunities that we have there. So I would like to show one more video and I think that I'm setting it up. Are you doing okay? Okay. It's the youngest and the smallest of all the castles this is our built in West Africa. I need a castle with some of our audience. Uh, they were able to give their perspective on their experience. Right, this beach, right, the land, the people, I feel at home. I feel at home. And um, these are the type of experiences that we wanted to create for people within the diaspora when they visited the continent. Right now, we exist in Ghana, but our hope was that we would be able to expand to um, activate in other countries as there's been, ex um, there's been an exponential request for our presence in areas like uh, Uganda, Kenya, South Africa, well as other countries that are interested in the type of experiences we've been able to create in Ghana. Um, and one thing we've noticed is that people that have been willing to come to Ghana have also uh, requested information about visiting other African countries. So our feeling is that if we can create spaces that tell these stories for people within the continent, pieces that they can understand, the pieces that they can recognize are very familiar um, and experiences that they will enjoy, that we can uh, foster conversation between um, people on the continent as well as the diaspora ensure that um, 
with, you know, uh, with communicating and helping each other effectively. And also just kind of leveraging our partners. If you're going to market for Africa, you can, you can work with the talent that exists on the continent. We can't hear you. Um, yeah, just uh, speak up, um, up to, yeah. Sorry, and uh, just, I was just mentioning, the last thing I wanted to mention was just kind of leveraging our partnerships um, and the partners that we've been able to bring to the continent, uh, making them understand the talent that exists on the continent as well as in the diaspora and, and, and the type of stories that we want to consume as diasporas ourselves or people from the continent as well. So thank you so much for having Great, me. Great, fantastic. Um, I think that was really fantastic. And um, thank you so much for showing us just the powerhouse of um, economic development, youthful economic development in culture, um, you know, the Africa that we want to be. Um, really amazing work. And I know Afrocello um, attracted so much interest from thousands of people um, who wanted to come to, to Ghana. And that was just before COVID lockdown. So coming back to the focus of the session and the policy dialogue, reflections on the role of cultural heritage and tourism sectors in building forward better post-COVID-19. Um, if I'm going to call on my, so that we don't have much time because um, I think we just have about 25 minutes or so. And I'm going to call on um, uh, Onyakachi Bambu um, to co-moderate with me with the questions that's coming from, from, the, from the participants, here, those in attendance. Um, uh, to, to the panelists and also to the excellencies, if they are still with us. Um, I'm sure that um, there are some questions that may come their way on, you know, the strategies that we build for social justice and acknowledgement of the icons that must be returned and going beyond the metaphor of returning just a Sarah Bartman um, to South Africa. What does it mean to actually return? What is that Sankofa bird moment um, for the economy? Um, and we've, we've, we've heard Ababeo speak about that, Mr. Ababeo. Um, you know, what does it mean? What are the strategies that we need to employ um, in going forward? And we heard wonderful inputs there also from um, uh, our excellencies this morning um, and the panelists uh, on, on youth and digitization. So um, I think I'll open now the discussion uh, to those in attendance um, and to really to focus those questions in the dialogue on um, the role of cultural heritage and tourism sectors in building forward the post-COVID-19 and sharing that best practice. Thank you. So, <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, June. And um, we, we've had um, a lot of comment and chatter on the chat box, um, but they've been mainly about people expressing the, uh, how much they've admired the presentations and been inspired by them and also wanting to link up with the speakers. So one of the things we'll try and do is to get permission from the speakers uh, about whether we can sh uh, share some of their connections. I think people are really inspired by the work that they've heard described and they'd like to follow up afterwards. One very concrete question that came through was that um, there was a, a sense that um, those who were given citizenship in Ghana uh, were only from the Americas um, rather than from the UK. And I think there were people who were interested in returning to Ghana. And I, um, I think that's been answered to say that actually uh, it wasn't just exclusively to uh, to the diaspora from the Americas that uh, some people from the UK were also granted citizenship in Ghana. So those questions have been answered. I would urge people to please use the chat box and ask your additional questions. But June, I'll leave you to ask the panelists um, direct questions that you feel came out of the conversations. Yes. Thank you so much, Onyakachi. Yes. So to our panelists, um, what what are the the issues that you think have really come through um, in this COVID period um, in terms of best practice? In, in, in speaking to the AU and the UN on a, how we can strengthen, based on your real experiences in the field, how we can really strengthen um, culture, um, 
and the cultural sector and economic development on the continent in a post-COVID uh, context. Um, so I'm going to ask um, each one, I'm, I'm going to ask Molemo um, as the first speaker, and, and then I'm going to ask uh, Abdul, and then I'll go back to Alessandra and um, Ababio, Akwasi, Akwasi Ababio. So Molemo, what, what would you um, want to emphasize for, for, for justice um, in going forward? I mean, I think that um, one of the big learnings for us in the kind of cross-continental conversation is the deep value in um, shared experiences and shared heritage um, across the continent and, and of course, um, the diaspora as well. And I think that, uh, as others have mentioned, um, the African Union obviously has a substantial role to play in that kind of thing in, in, in events like these, um, but also potentially in a policy framework. And, and, and there have been some steps towards um, sort of developing a more coordinated position around restitution. Um, and those are still in process. Uh, West Africa very much um, with ECOWAS kind of leads in this space and funnily enough in, in Ghana as well, um, really working towards developing a more kind of formalized framework around restitution. But I think that's um, kind of a key point. And then of course, as you've mentioned, as the youngest continent in the world, um, I think there is a, a deep need to enable kind of greater space and uh, representation for younger people in this conversation. Um, I think within the kind of heritage space, it often becomes uh, a conversation that young people don't immediately step into um, and don't immediately take up much space in, um, but have obviously a lot of um, future kind of skin in the game in terms of being able to connect to history and heritage. Um, so those would be my two kind of initial thoughts. Sure. Can I push you a little more limo? Um, so, um, you know, there's, it's, it, there's a big kind of, interest in, in bringing the people back, bringing, you know, the human remains back. Um, and um, that there's not really a kind of recognition. For example, the UK, um, we do know, um, is, um, you know, there's a kind of indifference um, and, and there's not always acknowledgement. Do you think for young people, this is coming through in the policy strong enough? What does it mean, you know, in the digital space of restitution when there's still so much grappling with the people from Namibia that must come home that, you know, when I, when I, I say people because mm. it's beyond yeah. human remains, um, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond that. So, um, does this have any meaning for, for young people and the kind of work you are doing? Is there a whole new interpretation for policy or not? You know, I think that the big challenge at the moment is how so much, so much of that debate is driven from the global north. Um, and of course, one of the, the big spaces for young people engaging with this debate was Black Panther. Um, and that particular scene in which one of the characters um, demands and takes um, um, an object from Wakanda back. Um, but even in that case, uh, that is a narrative that isn't being created by Africans from the African continent. Um, and I think there does need to be much more of a dialogue in that sense. Um, at the moment, it, it can feel a bit like a monologue um, and, and the, it, there needs to be a stronger, louder voice from the African continent in that sense. I think that scenes such as that and the kinds of visibility that it got point to the fact that there is definitely an interest and young people are definitely uh, feel quite strongly about the need for return. Um, but some of that conversation is also limited in the sense that um, return is, is as much about um, a, ma a material object or, or an ancestor, but is also about intellectual property, is about um, potential sort of economic value. And that broader conversation and, and its impact to the continent is also not something that is very sort of strong and vocal um, in our context. And in some ways it's happening sort of in the academic realm or the museum realm. Um, and I think young people would really be able to bring it much more to the public realm. Fantastic, because uh, yeah, it's a youthful continent. It's the youth, it's the majority, it's the future. And um, so I think it's a very important um, debate um, to center for youth or youth to center in the particular kind of discourse um, of what that acknowledgement and justice would mean, you know, and the community engagement and best practice around that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Malemo. Um, I wondered, um, Ab Abdul, would you like to respond? Yes, I agree uh, totally with what uh, Ms. Malemo was 
describe it. Um, I do think that the response. Abdul, your sound is terrible. Yeah, um, your yeah yeah. Just come up a bit. Sorry, I I can hear you clearly, but somehow people can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Yeah, just keep on speaking up. Yeah, so I, I was saying I agree with uh, what Malomo was describing earlier. Ms. Malomo was describing earlier. I, I think that um, 2019 and Ghana's uh, effort to welcome people back home in 2019 basically tells you that if welcomed, if, 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 if the countries uh, around the world, well, in Africa specifically, are, are putting out that they're welcoming people back home, that people will respond effectively. I, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to recognize is that around the world, people are engaged in conversations around racial justice, uh, social equity, and things of that nature. And those those feelings, uh, you know, at least within the diaspora and the, and the guests that we've um, welcomed to Ghana through Afrochella, um, have expressed have experienced Ghana in a different way that they may have experienced Africa or have seen Africa on their television sets and through uh, the media that they've um, they've been, uh, you know. I guess, experiencing throughout their whole lives. Um, and in 2019, by just being in Ghana, from the feedback that we received through surveys, uh, through testimonials that we received, you can just kind of tell that people are, are experiencing and seeing Africa in a whole new light. And now there is a possibility for them to choose Africa as a tourist destination. And now it piques that interest of also of them just kind of learning about the heritage of Ghana or learning about new ways to kind of figure out whether or not they can work there, they can live there, they can. Um, start a business there, buy land there. Um, and, and that feeling of ownership, that feeling of belonging is something that we feel that, uh, at least through some of the programs that have been described that can be created, um, provided we have that support uh, through policy from the government agency. So some of the things that Mr. Ababio mentioned earlier with Ghana easing, uh, you know, the process of getting a visa of something, something of that sort. It's something that's very, very small, but very effective in getting people to be encouraged um, in, in visiting the country. Uh, for us, it's been figuring out ways to work with the airlines to reduce the cost uh, of traveling to Africa, because that will also encourage people. Um, um, but from, from my perspective as, as, as a cultural festival manager, it's just kind of also encouraging uh, the tourism, the different tourism departments to kind of uh, take the time to be invested in telling more stories from the African perspective, whether it's around our food and celebrating our food, why we eat certain foods during certain time, around our music, around our arts and, and telling those histories. Uh, I think that it would allow us to kind of speak on a more informed uh, basis. And I think that that would kind of even eat, um, even further ease the the ability for us to kind of integrate and 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 work with each other more effectively and and for our festival at least that is our our goal and and that's been our mission since since our inception. Fantastic, Abdul, and I think what you're illustrating in your best practice is you know the multi the the those multiple layers of what return may mean you know economically spiritually. Um, educationally, you know, music, food, you bring it all together. Really absolutely fantastic. And I think, you know, the historian Toyen Falola, Nigerian historian at um, the University of Texas, speaks about the ritual archive and that power that we have in Africa and taking forward the ritual archive in terms of cultural capital, in um, terms of economic development, far beyond, you know, Walter Rotney's um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It's, it's about the self-determination. Um, yeah, really great. Um, I'm not looking to, to, yes, is, is there somebody talking or is it a microphone? Oh. On your classroom. Sure. Can I just ask Abdul sure. um, an additional question before you move on? Sure. Uh, how, how useful would be a West ECOWAS common visa be for you in terms of the work that you do so that people can come to Ghana and then perhaps visit the surrounding countries as well if they wanted to? Okay. Uh, and that's something we can also uh, uh, ask uh, Akwasi later on, but that, yeah. that proposal. I think that it will be an amazing opportunity um, if the government should, should, should explore that because a lot of the people that come to Ghana are spending upwards of 10 days in Ghana, right? Uh, so we do encourage them to visit other parts of, of Ghana outside of Accra, but a lot of them have been interested in going to Nigeria or Togo, or Cote d'Ivoire and things of that nature, which are very close to Ghana, uh, but they've had issues. So I've had 
uh, one of our uh, visitors actually visit Nigeria and due to her misunderstanding of her, her visa requirements, she was stuck in Nigeria for a day. So we've had to kind of figure out a way around that. So if, if we were able to kind of work with the different embassies uh, or work with the various uh, government agencies to kind of develop that West African uh, visa where people can, or African visa, whatever we need to kind of ease the impediments that exist for people that want to travel back to Africa to, to kind of give them uh, more encouragement, I think that will be, it'll be very helpful. I mean, the flight alone is intimidating, the flight costs. So, you know, having additional barriers that people have to kind of overcome to attend as well is, 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 is something that any, any type of alleviation will help. Thank you. Thank you. Does that help um, on your culture? Yeah, yeah. Um, it does. I mean, Sadak already, I think, has a regional uh, visa, um, so ECOWAS can catch up, and um, there's learning, a cross learning to, to do. Um, we've had some questions in the uh, in the chat box. Um, the one question was that we that was asked was um, that science in Africa has been under studied. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that culture um, can be used to get uh, the understanding and build up a, an appreciation of the importance of science in Africa, um, particularly in the context of um, the COVID and, and the search for a vaccine. And, and we know Africa has been really behind it, in that process. So that was one question that has been asked. Okay, so one of the panelists want to take that on. I know that Alessandra Cummins mm -hmm. spoke um, quite eloquently on, um, you know, going back to the pre-colonial and those, the, the lost archives um, and restoring them and how that is also very important in terms of us understanding that history of science um, in Africa and, and, and things that have really been invisibilized, but is there, the, but those things are there. So, um, yeah, so I don't know if the panelists would like to see Molemo, please respond. I can, I can certainly respond on some points in respect to that question, if you don't mind, I'd yeah. like to do that. So firstly, I, uh, we totally agree with that, um, that uh, perspective about the need to address um, the lack of knowledge about science. And, and one of the key things that we have to understand and take issue with is the epistemic injustices that underlie the terminologies that are used, still utilized within the science sector, okay? So the epistemology that is used to construct scientific knowledge is shot through with colonial um, controls and systems. So one of the key systems that um, we have seen that uh, needs to be addressed is that total uh, the, the, is undermining that total control by renaming and reinterpreting what um, what that heritage is. We do need to understand, of course, it's a long-term project, but it's a project that systematically could be addressed across the board by a number of our institutions. So the naming of plants, the naming of animals, the naming of um, new, uh, new chemicals, all of those need to be thoroughly interrogated and uprooted. Then um, there is the, the prevalence of this knowledge that is um, placed on the internet, is placed on the World Wide Web, it is in, um, it is informed by Wikipedia. This is where our young people, our students are getting their knowledge from. If we don't engage with the absence of uh, African scientific um, thought and achievement within Wikipedia, we are doing ourselves a disservice. So there's absolutely a need 
for the construction of um, policies and programs that are going to build capacity within our African and diasporic communities that are enabled to construct new knowledge and to bring to uh, bring to afford those who have been involved in that scientific information for centuries. Um, one of the ways in which that has been being addressed that I am aware of is those who are in the science of botany and who have been um, building new knowledge, but it's obviously it's typically at a, at a modest rate because as we've understood ourselves, we continue to underinvest in the development of our own, uh, our own knowledge systems. And we have to look at that. But similarly, we also need to, to recognize that there are some systems out there that we can work with. And the, um, I want to draw attention to the work being done um, in terms of oceanic sciences through UNESCO and the IOC and the need for more engagement, particularly by African communities because they are engaged, but not as much as they could be um, that would help address some of these shortfalls. These are just some observations. They are by no means uh, a complete answer because I'm not a scientist, but what I am is I am knowledgeable about how systematically history has under identify what the achievements are of African and African diasporic people through the continuation of epistemic injustice. Thank you, Alessandra. I think much needed for this debate, um, epistemologies and um, the lost archives and restoring that through languages, through African languages. And we have that within the, you know, the charters and, and, and so on. But um, how does one implement this and make that policy real and, you know, to bring community engagement and justice around these issues within both Africa and the African diaspora? Um, so, um, yeah, this, I see um, uh, Onya Kachi, you are um, watching the chat. We were going to give um, a fussy an opportunity to respond for the first round, but there were two questions that um, before we end, I know we're coming to the yeah. end. Yes. Um, John Giovanni had asked about whether the panel were interested in issues around restitution of the moving image. Um, of course, um, June, June runs a uh, the June Giovanni Pan-African a film archive um, and has been involved in trying to get uh, some of the colonial area films back and also um, contemporary artists uh, and filmmakers who have made films and um, you know a lot of those films are also in you know European collections at the BFI with the French and others so she wondered whether there was any commentary on that and then the final question that um, we wanted to put was um, earlier on people talked about Africa as a site of pilgrimage, mm. and also now the Caribbean, as um, Dr. Uh, Alessandra said. What does that mean when, you know, if people are coming there and they want a sacred space, are we, and they expect that because that's a lot of the motivation why people travel, are we meeting those expectations in the way that we look at those spaces as like, as sacred, for instance, you go to the castle on their markets next door and people get disappointed that um, uh, the spaces themselves are not treated with the weight of emotion that they think that they should be treated. So there were two questions from June and then this idea of uh, African spaces as sites of pilgrimage and, ha and have we come to terms with that? We, we go to Jerusalem and elsewhere and we behave differently, but in our own spaces, we tend not to. Thank you, Onya Kachi. Um, you know, if, if, are the people on the panel who'd like to answer those, respond? We don't have much time, so quick responses. We just have about five minutes left. Uh, June, I can answer on the- Sure, Alessandra, yeah. Um, but I, I can't, I, I, I don't want to take up all the talking time if one of the other members 
Well, no, that's fine. You can speak to the sites because I think we see it with Robin Island as well. It's a pilgrimage, but people come back with another sense of what that is. So it's bringing in revenue, but at what cost? So yeah. anyway, Alessandra, yeah. So um, a lot of the dialogue about this issue, uh, this this underlying challenge, was um, was engaged uh, at least. 20 years ago, or around 1999-2000, by UNESCO's um, partnership with the World Tourism Organization. And at that time, there was considerable discussion about how we could take forward um, uh, tourism in a number of these Caribbean and African countries when so much of the, the, the so many of the sites and so much of the knowledge was around this whole destructive history of enslavement um, and the removal of people by force from their homelands and um, their placement in um, Caribbean and other diasporic um, communities uh, without their consent. So there, there was a lot of discussion about the, the whole issue of how can you develop an ethically structured modus operandi in, uh, in terms of global um, tourism when, uh, when it could be viewed as exploitation of what people were then calling dark sites or, or contested sites, um, and that still is the kind of language that is used sometimes. And yet, at the same time, um, give access to people who want to know, who want to understand, who want to appreciate. So the question about today, are people um, who are on that pilgrimage being welcomed in the way they would assume or accept? And of course, that is not the case. We still have a long way to go in terms of, again, engaging with an understanding that your, your site your spaces within that site and the structures within that site are all embedded with colonial knowledge. So you have to address at least three strands of how to tell the story that is going to bring forward the, the, the abilities of African people to resist and to thrive and develop um, despite these disadvantages, and still acknowledging the connection between Africa and the diaspora, diaspora sites. A lot of what I have talked about is still um, part of the processes of the UNESCO um, Slave Root Sites of Memory Program, um, and um, the, the development of manuals that support site managers in how to better develop their um, their uh, interpretation of the site and their, their means of engaging with audiences and the recognition that different audiences come for different things. Okay. Um, and I think also that the, the whole process though of redesigning uh, some of the exhibits with new technologies, new um, film uh, presentations does help to address um, the issues of the, the 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 silences around history because there aren't objects and there aren't necessarily all the information there. So new technologies is a way of helping us to engage with those issues. I think I can, can I come in? Oh, one, more, one, one more thing. Um, the International Coalition of Sight for Conscience are also dealing with programming that um, engage the communities around these sites to help them address how they deal with the injustices that have been historically based and therefore how to engage with these sites without further psychological damage. Um, so that one is another um, uh, 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 program that I would absolutely advise. Sorry about that. Um, Thank you, Alessandra. Was that Mr. Ababio? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, Thank you, and I want to pick up from where Alessandra has just uh, left off, which is uh, basically, she mentioned an organization that I couldn't uh, um, take note of, but I think that um, 
whatever that uh, organization might be, if my memory, if, if I've understood what she said, basically they would then help the society or the, 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 the whatever, um, the, the, the immediate uh, surroundings or the place where these places are held in this um, sort of, uh, are, are seen as places of pilgrimage to be, you know, to manage it in a better way to make sure that, you know, it, it's, it's, it takes away some of the issues that they, you know, they, they have to address. For instance, if you take the Cape Coast Castle or some of the castles, which are obviously places that of um, um, constant visit by our diasporans when they visit, they, they, when they come on a visit together, most some of these people when they visit these places see these places as uh, as so much revered for them that they wouldn't want even to be paying money to go to these places themselves, and that they would rather see it as a place where. You know, rather than even calling them castles, as we have, you know, in our in mm -hmm. our in our literature, we call them castles. They would rather refer to them as dungeons, which is basically how they see it and how they felt their ancestries would have gone through that place as a dungeon, and therefore, you know, not really cooperative when you have to charge them money to go to these sites, and that they would rather visit these sites and then give you some sort of donation, rather. To manage the place than you know just commercialize it. There are places where they feel you know have been uh, the past uh, places of torture, places of you know degradation and places of humiliation. So mm -hmm. that is a very you know genuine is issue to deal with. And I suppose if we can have the I don't I don't on top of my head know how best we're going to be dealing with it. But certainly we 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 need to address this. And then I want to quickly come back on some of the issues that were raised earlier on, where some shared values and shared experiences as, um, as people from the diaspora and as common people in Africa of, of the black um, race. And then um, basically the role that the AU uh, has to play or needs to play in all this. I'm excited that the AU, you know, officially as a part of policy has, um, the, has, uh, has uh, accepted that the fifth or the sixth region, is it? And that within that concept has enabled a lot of African countries to start working together, you know, to I mean, working among ourselves, collaborating to see how best we can realize that common objective. For instance, those of us, as the chairperson for the diaspora, I mean, for the homecoming and the beyond the return, um, we've had visits from other African countries well, trying to collaborate with us to see how we can take things forward, you know, in the future. And uh, that, for me, is a very positive uh, direction. Uh, with regards to the issue of, you know, uh, restitution and you know, some of the things that we need to do, um, I suppose, you know, we need to work together as, you know, African countries to, and uh, the diaspora community as a whole, not just Africa, to see how we can press on those who have got the benefit of holding on to our artifacts, to not just return them, but to also return the lost revenues that would have come to us, you know, if we had possession of our own um, artifacts. So for instance, the lost economic values of what we have is lost, should be taken into, should be brought into the equation when we are talking about, you know, what we are due and what should be given back to us and what should be returning home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ababio. That's uh, really fantastic and re uh, real examples. So we're now going to end. We could have gone on for a long time. There are a lot of chats. Um, uh, some people had to leave in between um, because of time. And so we're going to bring this to a closure. I'm going to ask um, Mr. Onyakachi Vambu to, to have the closing remarks. Um, and um, uh, and then I think it's Ms. Ayman Kerr still here from the African Union um, to do to, to, to closure. Okay, not here. Okay, so on your Kachi, over to you. And then um, I will also just bring it together in terms of post COVID. Well, thank you, June. And um, again, thanks to all the partners um, at the African Union, um, CEDO, and also 
at uh, the uh, UNFPA. Uh, we appreciate the partnerships. I think there've been some really important conversations. We um, lost one of our uh, guests at the end, Malima, who had to leave, but she did make a point about um, the importance of science in all of this and to mention a project that she's doing looking at natural history and uh, archaeology um, um, uh, on the continent. And there's a whole other dimension on restitution of these uh, of African knowledge of archaeology and the scientific work that is needed and the dinosaurs themselves. So she wanted to uh, put that on the agenda. Um, unfortunately, there was no answer to June Giovanni's question, but um, there's a lot of work um, to take forward um, with the African Union, with ECOWAS, um, and the different with SADAC and different African countries. And I think we've heard some really good best practice of how to mobilize uh, young people to to come to the continent from the diaspora and and to look at that massive new market. Uh, and for a lot of time, we thought that the, the only market for tourism um, was that European beach or safari market. And as Ghana have shown, there's um, another huge market that uh, can, uh, uh, give really good results in terms of um, the impact on the economy, but also on the cultural level, connectivity, and as uh, Abdul was saying, just people coming in, becoming interested, wanting to settle, wanting to do business. So that kind of connectivity has so many other um, outputs, and uh, we will continue the work with our partners around around this to see how we can, uh, you know, deepen the policy implications and, and, and promote those at the AU level. Um, and all of this uh, is vital now, uh, given the impact on all our economies of COVID. So I'll leave um, June just to, to conclude. But my, okay. final, my final, final thing was just to thank her for steering us through a very complex uh, series of uh, conversations uh, today and uh, by doing it with skill and um, effortless ease. So thank you, June. Thank you, Onye Kachi. Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you, esteemed um, excellencies, attendees, um, everybody who's still here. And um, it is a great honor to, to moderate the session and just to end on some of the things that uh, key issues that emerged uh, from the different inputs. I think it's really asking for a closure between the tangible and the intangible and the free movement in Africa as well, which is still difficult. I just saw that in the chat. And so um, I think uh, we've caught in the nation state a paradigm where there's, it's not really that free movement yet, although there is a commitment to it from the African Union. Um, and so, um, you know what, in the post-COVID world, I think the, the, the presentations that really spoke to, um, you know, Molemo's uh, presentation, innovation, innovative strategies for youth of a youth, uh, youthful continent, the young people coming um, into policy more at the center because they are, they are the future, they are the continent. Um, and also, uh, you know, what do we do with the, with the stories of Africa? Um, Alessandra Cummins' uh, presentation, um, and then also Ababio's, you know, making this currency, but then the complexity of that and balancing that with the ethics and the return. You know, what does the return mean? Um, and acknowledging that there must be a return, there can no longer be an indifference um, in this decade. And also with Black Lives Matter and in this big, diverse, complex continent, um, you know, what does that mean in, in terms of community engagement and the stories and the knowledge of women? Um, to the center and um, therefore it's so heartening to, to, to have our um, uh, Dr. Kanim here, who's still, probably still here, um, who was one of those leading figures in, in helping us to what that would mean in terms of training, training young women, training, bringing those knowledges of those lost archives of women at the center 
that uh, COVID-19 has really amplified the crisis around epistemology, and yet we have so much to give that we must, it's there. It's not that we need to um, look for it, it's there. It's just like Sankofa bird going back, getting it and centering it um, as the Ghanaians would, would, would attest. So um, that is where I think we would end in terms of what that would mean in terms of justice and bringing the conversation of policy and implementation with the young people at the center of economic development for Africa going forward. Um, on that note, I'd like to um, end this uh, important dialogue and thank you all for coming. And thank you so much for a very rich and very informative a dialogue session, which I'm sure will inform um, AU policy, um, listening to, to the inputs. And um, I understand that this is, a, is available for you. It's being streamed. And so you can have this as an archive um, to also listen to and take further in terms of best practice in your own local environments. Thank you.